Okay guys, we got ourselves a 2000 Toyota Echo and the problem is the headlights are not working. Uh, if you see there, the high beam light is kind of on, it's sort of flickering. Uh, right now our lights are off, so I'll turn the lights on. Okay, it's no longer flickering. Now I'll flick, that's high beams on, that's high beams off, high beams on, high beams off, turn it back on again. Or sorry, we'll turn the lights back off again. Now, let's see if that makes any difference once we shut the vehicle off. Coincidentally enough, it's no longer flickering. So I'm gonna shut the vehicle off. And on. Okay, we'll turn the lights on. And then the high beam indicator comes on. Flicking this back and forth. That's lights off, lights on, lights off. So at least something's happening. Fire it up again. So we'll fire it up again with the lights off. And there we go, it's flickering again. So, the first thing that comes to my mind whenever I see that is a daytime running light module that is faulty and back feeding. Because again, as soon as we turn the lights on, that indicator goes on, regardless of whether we are in any of those positions. And you probably won't be able to see up there, but we got no lights no reflections on toolboxes, nothing. There's no lights of any kind. So my first thought with anything like that is daytime running light module. Let's go out there and take a look. Okay, so as usual, our first step is to go to wiring diagrams. Uh, so we will go to non-OE, that's what I like to start with, and headlamps, which are right here. So. Um, we didn't look for sure, but you know what? Uh, this thing screams DRL problem, especially with that high beam indicator. So we will just assume it's got DRLs because we're kind of assuming that's the problem. So we click on there and uh, let me get you to the full screen. Okay, so all I'm gonna do is just kind of get an overview. So we got fuses up here, we got our headlights here, um, we kind of got some spices. We got a DRL relay. There's a DRL module. We have our multifunction switch and then the grounds. So looking at this system here, it's actually a lot less convoluted than um, most of this generation. Typically what this generation of does for DRLs, um, usually what they'll do is for the low beams, you know, you'll have power coming, say, up the top, and then one of the filaments will be um, grounded, so that will get you your low beam for each bulb. So they'll each get 12 volts, so they'll each um, each of the low beam filaments will, will turn on full brightness. But then when it goes to DRL mode, it usually has a whole bunch of relays or a bunch of switching happening inside the DRL module. And what it does on most of these of this generation, instead of each bulb having 12 volts at full brightness, it'll run the power through both bulbs. So it'll put them both in series so that each one only gets six volts so that they're not as bright. But if we look here, it says hot all the times. Those kinds of systems where they put them in series, what it'll have is the power will come in off of a, a relay. So it needs to be able to turn that on and off, but since it has full-time power all the time, um, and it just switches the grounds, then it is not capable of putting these in series. Um, so we don't have to worry about anything uh, too convoluted. Um, we can kind of treat things as separate turn-ons so to speak. So we got our combo switch here, which is our main turn on, which provides the main ground. 
Um, we have a daytime running light module that's also capable of providing a ground. And we got our two bulbs. So um, we can look at certain things like we can look at the fuses, but the fuses, um, you know what, if the fuses were out, you know, what are the chances of both fuses being out at the same time? As well, they wouldn't cause the high beam indicator to come on, right? So the high beam indicator gets the power from the dome fuse. And then when the this side right here would be the, the high beam filament, when those have a ground on that circuit that comes to this splice and this terminal, it comes back down and turns on the high beam indicator. So in theory, this high beam indicator should only light if this circuit is grounded. Otherwise, if the combo or the instrument cluster is faulty, but um, for the mo for the time being, we'll assume that it's that it lighting is in fact intent, meaning that this circuit is grounded and it's trying to turn on the high beams all the time, even with the vehicle off. So, um, what can we go after? Well, we are assuming that our daytime running light module is bad, just because. It always is. But if we look at this, the daytime running light module is just another player in turning these on. Most of these systems of this generation, everything goes through the daytime running light module so that if it were unplugged, you would have nothing. If we look at this system here, we still, regardless of what's happening with the daytime running light module, we still have a full-time ground that comes up to our multifunction switch and then if our multifunction switch switches it will provide the ground directly to our headlights which then have a full-time power so what this means is our headlights should work regardless of our daytime running light module being plugged in or not right so at this point maybe it's not a daytime running light module but you know what let's take that out of the system We'll find it, we'll unplug it, and then we'll see if, if anything changes. Because with that unplugged, we would still resort to just a basic system, just providing ground through the combination switch. So uh, let's see if we can't find out where that lives. Okay, so sometimes finding components um, can be annoying on these earlier vehicles. So usually what I do is I go to the main page, uh, locations components and um, we will it's a module let's assume it's a relay relay box or junction box uh, instrument panel center console because I believe it said inside and what do we have headlight haha daytime running light relay main so this is what it should be for the actual module because it did say before um, for the relay, the daytime running light relay said it was in the engine bay. So this would be the module here. It should have those 12 wires. Um, as well, if we go back to, um, I'll print that picture off and bring it inside the vehicle and kind of show you where it lives once I find it. If we go back to our wiring diagram with DRL, um, one last thing to look at, uh, derail module, this will help us find things. If you see since this box is solid, right, where some of these other, most of these other boxes are dashed, if it's a solid box, that means that's a complete picture of the unit. So it only has 12 terminals, it only has these wires. We'll see, you know, at one end, we, we won't always know which end is pin 1 or which end is pin 12, but we will know that at one end we'll have uh, a red yellow followed by white black followed by white red some empty spaces uh, a red black kind of in the middle then at the other end we'll have a yellow yellow red yellow red and red black right so the orders should be the same so if we find something like that because it did say that there was a few other little modules potentially in that same spot if we find something with those colors then we can be confident that that is in fact the right module we'll unplug it and see if that makes any difference. So uh, let me find where exactly that lives way up under the dash and once I do that I'll give you a shot. Okay so we got our pictures of where it is 
Um, it's kind of in a really difficult spot to get to. We got our wiring diagram to kind of show the colors. And let me give you a shot of where it lives. Okay, so it's way up there and it's kind of a weird connector. The diagram shows it should be 12 pins. Um, it's definitely got more than 12 cavities. I don't know, maybe only 12 of them are numbered. But going off of the wire colors, that is definitely it. So um, let's turn it on and see if we have any headlights. Okay, we're gonna have some dinging. Um, so let's try turning it on. Okay, so we unplugged the daytime running light module and we went to check it. We still did not have any headlights. So then the next step to do, which is normally the first step, but uh, let's put this rep right. Whenever I have an issue like this, it's, you know, it's always a daytime running light module issue. So after I unplugged it and it's still, they still weren't working, um, I went to check the fuses and sure enough, they weren't dead. They were just out. Well, why would they be removed? You'll notice I have the key in my hand, and if you can see that blue light for the, the high beam indicator is still partially lit. Headlights are off, keys out of the ignition. That is why those fuses were missing. We do have a daytime running light module issue. Of course now, put the key in, fire it up, And, I don't know if you caught the first full flicker there. We got our lights off. Our headlights are on. Turn our headlights on. Our high beam indicators on all the time. Shut it off. Yep, so now, now that we have fuses in there, pull this key out so we don't stop that annoying dinger. Now that we have fuses in there, we do have high beams and high beam or and low beams. Um, we have headlights functioning. Let's unplug that DRL module again and see if that light, the high beam indicator starts working properly and maybe everything will work. You just won't have daytime running lights. So let me cr climb back underneath and see what happens. Um, it is unplugged and the high beam indicator is still on. Um, it's just kind of weird. We got our key out. Let's put it in there. Let's see if that works any differently now. And no, it sure doesn't. We still have that same uh, blink. I don't know if you can see it blinking out there as well as the high beam indicator. Our headlights are off. Turn the headlights on. Okay, we can see some lights did come on. It does appear that the high beams and the low beams are working, but with that indicator staying on, that's going to be a battery draw for sure. I went out that time. <laughs> it's haunted. All right, uh, let's go back to that diagram and see if we can find any other common denominators as to why that might be happening. Now, coincidentally, it does say that our dome fuse feeds power to the high beam indicator and then it gets the ground on the other side. Now, there is a diode there, so supposedly it's supposed to prevent back feeding, but coincidentally, our dome light is not working. Is that fuse gone? Okay, so a quick check. <laughs> the dome fuse is in place. That's good. Uh, we'll give it a quick check to see. It's because it's hot all the times. And we have a good fuse. So that's not the problem. Well, weirder things have happened. What if it's just that bulb, right? What if the dome ball being burnt out is causing it to backfeed and preventing uh, the headlight system from working properly and causing that? high beam indicator to flash weirder stuff has happened so uh let's go pop that open 
and see what we see. Okay, so I popped the cover off of that dome light and everything else appears to be in working order. Um, it's supposed to be hot all the time. We turn it on, turn the door, the door is open. Nothing's working. So rather than trying to do all the testing on that, um, I'm going to pull out those screws, drop it down, and just see if I can unplug that connector um, because there is a ground to there. And if we look, you know, it goes to this, these junctions, these splices, and they kind of feed everything. So it's very possible that if that is back feeding something, it could be causing um, that uh, high beam indicator to stay on because keep in mind this dome light is hot all the time um, the fuse at least um, because there are other possibilities are you know obviously one of these um, one of these splice packs could be kind of damaged the vehicle is a little rough um, it's been in a few fender benders so you know one of those wires could be kind of spliced together seems to be unlikely you'd think you'd have m bigger issues you know um, fuses pop and stuff like that the other possibility is we could just have a faulty um, instrument cluster. But let's rule this stuff out um, before we have to try and track something like that down because really, if it comes down to that, um, you know, you could spend a couple hours kind of pulling that out, trying to go to the um, electrical connector to it to try and figure out who's who and back probing this, back probing that, see what you have, but really with clusters kind of internally damaged doing back feeding like this usually if you spend all that time usually you don't get anywhere you don't find anything else out and you just say hey you, you need a cluster and you throw one in there and it, it fixes the job um so easiest thing to do right now um rather than testing that interior light we'll just unplug it all together okay so we got it hanging down now let's see if i can do this one-handed of course i don't see anything obvious uh, I don't think I can. Let me put you down for a second. <clears throat> okay, so looking at the back of this, uh, I don't really see much. Um, doesn't really seem like that's super likely that that would cause um, a back feeding issue, but <laughs> you never know. So, um, and it's better to unplug the whole thing than just popping the bulb out. So let's try it, put the key in so our lights are off, okay high beam indicator staying off, we're in neutral, keep the lights off, fire it up, and it's still kind of coming back to life and the headlights are flickering. So, really, whoa, got that door. Um, so, really, at this point, uh, you could have a cluster issue, but then if it were a cluster issue, why would the actual headlights themselves be turning on? Mm, cluster might still be able to backfeed it. Or you have a headlight switch issue. But the headlights appear to be working. Hmm, peculiar. So one of the things that makes these early 2000s slash late 90s vehicles awful to work with is there's actually three different controls that can be turning headlights on. We have our main switch, we have our daytime running light module, and we also have this headlight relay. So if you look at it, it's controlled by the door lock control relay and um, so presumably that's the sort of thing you hit the door locks you know with a fob or whatever um, I don't even think this one has a fob but you know it's probably wired in there anyways and it just flashes the lights so down at the bottom here we have a ground ground comes up to the relay on terminal 4 when the relay closes it just supplies that ground into the normal headlight circuit which bypasses the combo switch all together so if you look at it, it comes to this splice pack here um, in an M7, and you know it'll go up, it'll go across, go up to each of the headlights um, on Terminal One, 
and then it comes back around over to the DRL module. Now, if we look at the high beam indicator and we follow the top wire that comes to the dome light or from the dome light, if we follow the other wire, that goes over to this other splice. So that tells us this headlight relay would not be turning on the high beams, it would be turning on the low beams. But we're seeing, you know, like right now, our low beam indicator is still lit. Um, so we don't even have to go after that because that would not cause the low beam indicator to light. Um, theoretically, if you had, a, you know, one of these dual filament bulbs, a broken bulb with a filament that went across and this was out as well, maybe, right? But you're asking an awful lot. So, um, because if that makes sense, we, it's hot all the time on, on wire 3, but it does not have a ground unless the daytime running light is providing a ground, unless the combo switch is providing a ground, or unless that headlight relay is providing a ground, but this headlight relay would not be providing a ground to the high beam circuit. So really the next best thing to go after at this point is to go after the combo switch, and just to make things easier rather than pulling it out and trying to diagnose that we're just going to unplug it and see if that causes that um, high beam indicator light to go out completely obviously we're not going to have any headlights at all but if that head high beam indicator light still kind of comes on then that lets us know that either we have a cluster issue or an outside wire issue that's chafed together somewhere so um, that's the next easiest thing to do is we'll try and unplug that. Okay, so we're gonna have dingers because um, we need to be able to rotate the steering wheel. Uh, we have a screw right there. We have a screw on the outside right there and cranking it over. We have a screw right there. You don't have to take the steering wheel off for these, um, but you do need to be able to rotate the steering wheel. So let me bust those out. Okay, so with all those screws out, we can very carefully find a spot where we can pry these two apart. There we go. <laughs> Make sure you use non-marring tools. <laughs> okay, so we got that separated. So again, we're just unplugging it. If I can get to that. Come on. Well, this sucks. I just realized <laughs> that I didn't, I wasn't recording that last bit, so I don't know how much I missed, but um, we did unplug the connector. And if you look right there, our high beam indicator is still on. So going back to our wiring diagram, we have our switch unplugged, we have our daytime running light module unplugged. Um, really that only leaves the cluster itself, which seems more likely, or some weird wiring issue. Now since it's flickering, it's coming and going, to somehow have a wire um, you know, somehow have a wire kind of rubbing through on off on off, you'd, you'd think you'd have something more steady than this. It sure seems like some kind of solid state electronics, some kind of circuit board. Okay, so we have our switch unplugged, our keys out, our high beam indicators on, and our headlights are in fact on. Hmm. I think the next thing to do at this point is we'll pull out the cluster, unplug it, and see if the headlights turn out. Because everything's off. Nothing should be on. Okay, so it's after hours and everyone's gone home, so I can do the wrap up. You know, sorry for the first part of this being kind of disjointed. It was during the day, you know, people coming and going, trying to make a video when I should be working, all that sort of business. So, one of the reasons why I don't like trying to do anything with headlights with, you know, on these kinds of vehicles, the late 90s, early 2000s, 
is everything was a mess. You know, in modern vehicles, this would all be in some computer uh, control module, all with separate circuits, and then they can do things with logic. So say, you know, your headlights, right? All the different functions, right? Whether you want the, the headlights to blink when you hit the key fob, you know, your DRLs, your low beams, your high beams, all that stuff, one module, one driver, and just different inputs um, that factor into his programming to determine whether or not to turn that light on. These older vehicles, they didn't have that, so they re um, they deal with uh, relays and stuff like that. You know, the older, older ones, you know, they would have like three or four different relays and the, all the, the circuitry would go through them all, through the 87 and 87A. Um, you know, they would do the same thing too with the, the fans. You know, if you had your main cooling fan as well as your condenser fan, you could have a, a low, medium, high setting. And they did it all with relays. Really convoluted wiring diagrams. Um, but anyways, I digress. This system here, we have a few different players. Um, if it wasn't obvious with the, the first part of the video. So we have our um, multifunction switch that can turn headlights on and off. We have our DRL module that's, uh, you know, sitting up in there. That can turn the headlights on and off and the high beams. We have the door lock um, relay. So say with the key fob that can turn the low beams on, bypassing that switch altogether, right? Um, you also have the instrument cluster that could be back feeding, keeping things alive, right? If the circuitry for that bulb um, is wiped out, it could back feed to that circuit and that would keep the high beams on. So rather than pulling up diagrams, trying to, you know, get to the back of things, trying to figure out who's who or what's what, what's out of place, the easiest thing in a case like this is unplug stuff. So anytime you have a headlight issue and particularly you see that high beam indicator on a generation like this, you immediately think daytime running light module. Typically it puts the power through the high beam circuit both of them in series. So I was actually really surprised when I unplugged it and it did the same thing. So next easiest, you know what? Um, hey, make sure that the fuses are in uh, or check the fuses, right? Stuff like that. Cause I know there was some kind of wonkiness going on with this. And sure enough, both the fuses were missing. They were missing, why? Because the headlights wouldn't turn off. So put them back in, hey, headlights are on. So next easiest thing is you know what, our multi-function switch. Well, again, rather than trying to figure out what's happening, just unplug it. System stays on. So we know that that's not it. So the next thing is, well, we're kind of left with our options because that daytime running light um, relay that only supplies the low side. So somehow if that were, um, stuck closed you still have to have something else faulty to have the high beams on so that's grasping for straws so basically what we're left with is our instrument cluster or basically you know the wire is shorted somewhere so same thing too pull the instrument cluster out this one actually comes out quite easy um there's a little pocket a little um cover here in the center right there Turns out you don't even need to pop that out. Um, you just get a little um, bevel clip tool underneath there and just kind of lift it up a little bit, pop, pop, and the whole thing slides forward, that whole bezel. And then there's the two Phillips screws that hold the cluster in. Uh, you can take that out and then you can just unplug both of the connectors to the instrument cluster. <laughs> well, of course the high beam indicator goes out, but our high beams stay on. So at that point, that means we got ourselves um, a short somewhere. That wire is shorted. It is a ground side control, so it'd be shorted somewhere. So easiest thing to do, because you know, we, we could have an issue with the fuse box, is sometimes when you're kind of, when you're changing game plans, sometimes it's good to just start with something simple. 
In this case, I went to go to unplug. Um, this is it right here, the DRL relay number five, they call it. I don't know why they call it number five, but they call it that there. I don't know if you can read that. DRL number five. Not a Mambo, a DRL. So, you know, unplug that, see what happens. It shouldn't make any difference because we're having an issue with the high beams. Now, um, we do make mental note of the condition of the body of the vehicle. Um, you know, a, a, a war, try that again. A wire rub through is always a possibility when you got a car like this. So, I go to touch it and you know what I find? It's hot. What does that mean? That means it's on. Well, thinking about it, we kind of knew it was on because, hey, our headlights were staying on and the high beam indicator was on. So go to unplug it. Of course, it doesn't make any difference with our headlights, but the thing that's nice about it is with the wire shorted out, you know, you hold it just above contact and just kind of touch contact and you'd feel it click and bzzz, you hold it just out of that sweet spot and you can feel it buzz. So it gives you a nice indicator to know that yes, the circuit is grounded. We can fiddle with some things and go back to that and check to see, is it still grounded? Cause it's not supposed to be grounded with the key out and everything off, right? It should be off. So next easiest thing to do, unplug um, one of the connectors for one of the bulbs. Now that's not capable of back feeding it with a ground, but that it separates the circuit a little bit. Right, so if you unplug it and all of a sudden the lights go out, it's not a bulb problem, but it lets you know, hey, it's on that side of the circuit. So uh, I unplug both, go back to my relay, and you know what, it's still buzzing, it's still clicking, so it's still shorted out. So then you start, what you do, when any time you're looking for um, a shorted wire, you're gonna find it on a visual inspection. You know, wires don't short themselves. They rub on things. So easiest thing to do to start with is you start with the harnesses by the bulbs. Those are the things most likely to rupture. And you kind of look at them and I look to see, are they anywhere near any body damage? So if we look at this one here, let's wake you up for a second. Um, if we follow that, so that harness goes that way, and then kind of goes over here. I don't know how well you can see that. And then it goes right into that um, fuse box. And then from there, kind of goes into the vehicle. Well, I don't see anything that looks blatantly obvious as to where that would rub. So we go over to the other side. And we follow that. And it comes back. And guess what used to be there? Hmm. This is not a good spot for that to be sitting. And what do we see underneath? Yeah, it rubbed through. There's your problem. Don't be putting junk like this in the engine bay. Oh my. It was just shoved right down there. This junk. So that was the whole problem. Everything started. Uh, because it had a dead battery instead of just replacing the battery let's just charge it hmm and I mean you know if you look at this right it was just rubbing on the belt and that's the uh, oh no that's the 12 volt side I thought that was the 120 volt side <laughs> that would have been really bad yeah don't be going to throw stuff in an engine bay that doesn't belong it's bad enough when people stuff rags in engine bays so they can fill up with oils and all that sort of stuff be nice little fire starters but you know a big unit like there and sure enough it made a hole thankfully it didn't break any of the wires so I was able just to goop it up with liquid electrical tape uh, it's not pretty but you know what if the wires not broken I don't want to cut it just to put um, heat shrink over it that stuff is actually pretty good um, just FYI, if you do have a liquid electrical tape, same thing with all your compounds, um, the, the vulcanizing compound for, you know, tire patches and whatever, store them upside down. They'll last a bit longer. They will still dry out, 
I've never came close to using up one of those containers before it dries out. Whoa, running into things. But I digress. So thankfully I was able to liquid electrical tape it. I'll put some regular tape around there when I get a chance. If you have time, it's always best, you know what? Give it 10 minutes or so between coats. Put a few different coats, but give it more than enough time for that stuff to dry, then put another coat. Saves you from having to go back to it. So well, that is the end of that story. You, you just look for the obvious things, right? You see something like a big unit like that, that's where you're gonna find your shorted wire. Otherwise, if this harness right here, if that got really close to the body, you know, say it went um, on the outside of the body, like between uh, right here and the, the, the inner fender, if it went along there, then sure, that's where you would look, right? You'd pull the, the fender liner off and you'd probably see the damage right there from where it collided with something. So anytime you have shorted wires, you know what, you start with the devices, you know, say like headlights, you look at kind of connectors, you look at anything that rubs, um, you're, you're kind of going with a, um, a visual inspection, you just kind of follow it back, try not to disturb anything too, too much, it's always handy. If, you know, if I didn't find anything right away, basically what I would do is I'd pull that relay out and I would put in a test light um, that I could just visually see um, whenever it's shorted, right? Because that's not supposed to be a ground. I would just put a wire in there to a bulb and then the other end of that bulb to battery positive and then I could get a visual indicator to know when it is shorted because the last thing you want to do is disrupt something and well, you know, is it still shorted? You want to be able to see things. Um, anyways, long winded. So hopefully I can kind of salvage enough of this to, to make it worthwhile. I, I thought it was kind of an interesting case of just, um, what do you do? You know what, just keep going forward, do the next easiest thing, the most logical next easiest thing. You don't always have to start pulling out your back probes and digging into wires because you know what, on a vehicle like this, a case like this, you could end up spending a lot of time and not necessarily get any further far, further forward. Okay, so as an added bonus, we are also after why the radio display does not light up. You know, in fact, the whole radio doesn't light up. And also, if we look right here, our cigarette lighter does not work. Keys in the on position. And we got nothing. So let's pull up a wiring diagram for that. Okay, so we're now at our computer, so now it's time to try and find some fuse or some kind of common denominator for the radio, the um, cigarette lighter, and the clock. I wouldn't be surprised if that's a fuse. I wouldn't be surprised if they're all the same fuse because typically that's why stuff involving a cigarette lighter um, power, power port, that's typically why they don't work. People plug in stuff that either over um, draws too much current or they plug in um, you know connectors they're cheap and they're kind of they short out themselves so let's go to back to our main vehicle I'll flip you over to the main screen and diagrams we go with non OE that's always what I like and power and ground of power all right let me get you bigger for one second Oh, too big. There we go. So at this point, I'm just going to scroll down and I'm just going to try and find the PowerPoint. Um, this is old enough to probably call it a cigarette lighter or cigar lighter. So because that will probably be easiest to spot. Huh, this one says clock and radio and player. This dome fuse, but it doesn't say cigarette lighter. So I'm just going to keep going. Do, 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 combo fuel, none of that. Aha, what's this? Cigarette lighter. So we follow that, and there we go. There's an ACK fuse for accessory, it's a 15 amp. 
and it says it also goes to the radio and player and the clock. So we'll check for this because this is a common denominator amongst all of them. So sure enough, as I kind of thought, you plug something into the cigarette lighter that uh, blows the fuse, you're going to take out the radio, you will take out the clock. And if we come over here, that's the instrument panel. So behind the, the left side of the dash, so that's the one in the car. So we'll pop off that cover, we'll be looking for an accessory fuse, which is a 15 amp. Okay, so our wiring diagram says we are looking for a 15 amp AC fuse, which is that one right there. And I don't know how well I can prop that. Maybe that will stay with that bottom blue one. Burnt out. Power on one side. And nothing on that side. So let's get a replacement fuse for that. Then maybe our uh, clock, our cigarette lighter, and heck, maybe even the radio itself will work. Yeah, <laughs> that would be an easy fix. Bam! Hmm. Yeah, we got a tow truck behind us, pretty loud. And would you look at that? And then if you can see that too, that's lit. So all that stuff is good. nice well there you have it now I know this video is a little disjointed <laughs> the joys of trying to film while you're you know still working and all but I felt like this was a good case study a good way to show um, what you do when you have a short I know when you're starting off with electrical it can seem daunting you know how are you supposed to find a short well basically this is what you do you rule everything else out you unplug anything attached to that harness so it's basically supposed to be just a harness just kind of floating not connected to anything so it shouldn't have any path to ground it shouldn't have any path to power it shouldn't have any path to anything it should just be uh, an open harness now they almost always are shorts to ground you know the, the wire rubbing through and it's now touching chassis occasionally you can get a short to power to something else um, more often than not, when you have a short power or a short something else, it's usually a component, you know, um, some kind of solid state electronic that is shorted internally and as soon as you unplug it, um, then the short goes away, right? But shorts to ground, you're almost always looking at um, uh, a harness that is rubbed through somewhere and is now touching um, the, the bare wire is now touching the chassis. So how do you find them? Well, normally you find them with a, this kind of way. You do the visual inspection. You start off at um, the likely scenarios, whatever gets disturbed. You, you, you look for brackets, all that sort of stuff. You try not to disturb the harness that much. If you don't find it on a visual inspection, then what you can do is grab something like a test leg, attach it to some convenient spot on the harness, um, and then the other end you can attach to battery positive. If it does have a short to ground at that moment, it will light up. Of course, it's not supposed to light up. It's not supposed to have a path to anything. It's open on both ends. And then you can go through and you kind of shake the harness, shake the harness, shake the harness until you start seeing this flicker. And then you kind of narrow it down. You try to move the harness as little as possible until you find the spot where it is shorted. Now, the problem with doing this is you have to physically see this, right? Well, another option you can do is on your multimeter, you have a setting here, that's your resistance. You can measure resistance. Well, you also have a setting, that's your continuity setting. So, yes, it'll tell you resistance as well, but when you touch, when it has a path between the two leads, it makes an audible tone. So you can do the same kind of thing. You can hook this in, one end, except it's not a test light, so one end would go to the harness, the other end would go to ground, or whatever you suspect it's shorted to. And then you hear the tone, 
when it has a short and you just go through and you shake the harness until you, you hear it kind of beeping on and off on and off um, until you can make it so hey yeah there's the spot right there um, <clears throat> Sometimes what happens is, you know, what if you got a mouse that's kind of eating into something, right? What if you suspect that harness might be shorted, say, in the headliner? You don't want to remove that. So you always try to separate the, the harness. You know, if you got a connectors, you can unplug them, all that sort of stuff to break it down to branches, test which side is shorted. Sometimes you don't have a connector. So sometimes if it's something like you suspect maybe it's up in a headliner and it's a lot of effort to pull that down, then cut it. Make sure to cut it in a nice spot that you can easily get to and easily make a nice splice. But if you cut that and you test, say, the, the branch that goes back towards the headliner, the branch that's hard to get to and is not shorted there, then you saved yourself a lot of time by not having to deal with that. And you can then focus on this side of the branch, right? So sometimes you have to snip things. Um, it can save you from making the wrong call. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so anyways, uh, I uh, want to pass this on. I, I thought there was a lot of good information in there and it's just what you do when you got a short. More often than not, you can find it on a visual inspection and they're usually not too scary. So uh, as always, just wanted to say thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.